we're in a series called Recalled, and really in the series Recalled, it's, it's we've all been called. God has called every believer out of, and, and, and we live life, and as we live life, a lot of things in life really cause us to slide back into thinkings, thought, belief systems. A lot of times we get recalled, we get saved, and we never change what we believe. We think, well, now I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. But a lot of the same beliefs of, that we established over life never got changed. We, they, they never got renewed. And so we go through the Christian life not experiencing life. We experience the same death. Even though we might be saved, we're not experiencing the life God has for us. And I, I believe in 2016, the best year ever, God is recalling us back to the to the word, calling us back to the life that he has for us. In the first week, we talked about being recalled to position, understanding that I am a son and a daughter of the King of Kings. I mean, God is my dad. Jesus said, who is my mother? Who is my, who is my brother and sister? He said, you're my brothers and sisters. The Bible consistently says that God is our father. When you come to Christ, you give your life to Christ, he becomes our dad. I mean, we have earthly connections, but ultimately, he's my father. And, and Jesus is my brother. In some ways, he describes it, he's our bridegroom. There's an intimate relationship. We have position. You can't hear any of the other messages in the series of Recalled until we understand, one, position. Who we are in Christ. That God's desire for us. That me as a father, who, how many know parents are a little biased? Right? Right? If you, ever, if you ever doubt that, go to a basketball game. You, you know, those referees hear it from biased parents. All the, They foul them. That was a foul, right? And then they go down to the exact same thing on the other side. Except it's their kid doing it. That was no foul, right? There's a bias. And we mean it. We're, we're, it's not like we're trying to lie. Parents mean that, right? Parents are they're, they're favorably disposed to their kids. How many would agree with that? Can I tell you something? So is your heavenly father. Because the characteristic that, that, ha that you have in your father, that a father possesses for his children, is perfected in the heavenly father that has even more of that towards you. Somebody should say amen. amen. He's not a mean ogre in heaven looking to stomp you on the head because you messed up today. In fact, he, he loves you a ton. And he, he looks over a whole lot. It says love covers a multitude of. Did you ever consider God as perfect love? And he just covered a multitude of. He looks past it because he loves you. Did you hear that this morning? Okay, so that's position. You need to know position. You need to believe position before you can ever accept what I talked about last week, which is his promises. That there are 7,000 promises in the Bible, 7,000, I promise you, you don't know them all or have read them all. But there are 7,000 promises in the written word that does not include the promises that he's personally given you and the prophetic promises that he's given you through some other person. That we are promised people. I am a child of promise. Just say that this morning. I am a child of promise. Like God's got tons of promises for me. And until you really accept and believe that you're a promised child, you'll never understand this message that I'm going to talk about today. These messages all kind of build on each other. And I was going to talk about power today, but the Lord caused me to rearrange the order of these messages that I'm going to preach on. And I believe each one build off each other. So I believe there's a reason God wants me to talk about prosperity first. Now, as soon as I bring up prosperity, well, before I do that, let me, let me give you the theme verse for today, or for the whole series. 2 Peter 3.2 says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through the apostles. So, so essentially what he's saying is, I want you to recall the promises. I want you to recall the Old Testament as well as the, what was given in the New Testament. He's recalling us back to the whole Bible. Now, there's some that say, well, I don't, I don't really accept the Old Testament anymore. I'm just new. I'm a new covenant. If you're truly new covenant, you take the whole thing. It's always been about faith. The Old Testament was always about faith. It was never about the law. The law never saved anyone. The Bible tells us that. The law never saved anyone. It was never about the law. It has always been about faith. 
always. The faith that there was a Messiah coming in the old and faith in the Messiah that came in the new. Amen? Amen. So, so we, we get to this place to talk about prospering, and, and uh, there's, been, there's been such a deception that has occurred in the church among Christians that we have literally disposed of this idea of prosperity. It has become an evil word in the church because there have been perverted preachers that have gotten up and taken it to an extreme. In this, there are ditches on both ends, and they've taken it to extremes. And so there are people, Christians, that say, oh, I don't believe in a prosperity gospel. That's what we gave it. And what we did was we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Because the Bible talks a lot about prospering a lot and I can tell you in this room even though you may say I'm not a prosperity guy you would love for it to be true because I can tell you right now how many want your prayers to be prospered right how many want your 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 uh, your job to prosper that when you work you want to prosper at your work do you think God wants you to fail no, God wants you to prosper. God wants everything you to t- that you touch, he wants it to prosper. But if you've bought into the lie today that God isn't for you, that he's not wanting you to prosper, then you'll believe this lie. Satan, I mean, if you're sitting here and you're going, I don't believe God wants me to prosper. Well, guess what? Neither does Satan. Satan believes the same thing you just said. He doesn't want you to prosper either. He doesn't want your, your whatever you put your hand to to prosper at all. And there are people that literally, they hear that and they preach it to their disciples and to their churches and their family and their children and their friends and their enemies. They tell their kids, well, we don't believe in that prosperity thing. And they rob their kids of something God fully intends to do in their life. You know, our kids, I, I'll tell you, our kids know more than we think they know, right? We can tell them one thing, but our kids know what we talk about in the back room. When we're whispering, our kids know exactly. They have a gift in understanding whispers, right? They got like super. How many parents in here know what I'm talking about? And, and, and uh, you know, I have one in particular uh, child that, um, like, she wants, you know, when you're preaching, and you preach the word, and you're, you're preaching that truth, and they're listening more than you think they are. And then I go to make a decision with my wife about something. She's like, oh, Dad, uh, you're not doing this? I'm like, thank you very much. Shut up. I'm the preacher in the family. You just stay quiet. All right, our kids... Our kids, I mean, there was one time we made a decision with the twins, and, and, and uh, well, I already kind of, and one of the kids... Said, so, Dad, I really don't think you handled that correctly. I'm like, you can just shut up now. They're not your kids. You, you will get your own later. You can mess them up. Like, we'll mess up ours all by ourselves. Right? Kids understand. That, you know what kids become? They think they'll start to be, believe what you think even. Okay? What you believe. So here's the difference. We think in our mind. We believe in our heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Okay? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you may think, you may think that God wants to prosper you, but what do you believe? There are a lot of things you can think, but you don't really believe. Because you do what you believe, even though your thinking may be different. Does that make sense? And so you may be here and you may say out of your mouth, I believe God wants to prosper him, but your, all your action says you don't believe that. Your decisions you make don't agree with that. They don't align with the fact that you believe God wants to prosper. In fact, you believe that, it, you know, there's a scripture that says, if God is for you, who can be against you? That, I mean, I'm going to give you so many scriptures today that if you leave this place this morning thinking God wants to do anything else but prosper you, then you are not listening, listening to what I'm saying this morning, okay? So we're going to get in here. I want to get in the story that we're in, though, first, And it's the story of Israel. And I need to set up the story first. You can put the verse up on the screen. I want to set it up because Moses was in the backside of the desert. For 40 years, he was in the palace. 
He knew his vision. He knew his purpose for being in the palace. He knew he was supposed to deliver the Israelites out of, out of bondage. But what happened was Moses made a mistake, and he ended up in the backside of the desert. So here's Moses in the backside of the desert. He felt like a failure, felt like he made a mistake. He's like, all my dreams have shattered. They've crashed. Now he's a shepherd of a flock in the backside of the desert. He's walking through the desert, and he sees a bush. And in the bush is this flame. And it's God. It's God represented as fire within the bush because the bush isn't burning. It's just a fire in the bush. And he walks up and the voice comes from the bush and the bush says, the fire says from the bush, it says, Moses, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And he, and he does that and he comes in. And, he, and then God unravels. He opens up the story. Moses, this is what I've called you to do. I've called you to deliver the Israelites from the oppression of the Egyptians. But before God could get Moses to deliver the Israelites from the oppression of the Egyptians, he had to deliver Moses from the oppression of the thing that was holding him. Okay? Now, Moses, and I'm going to talk about this more a little later, but Moses was bound in this oppression of, uh, of, of being a failure and what, is, what I'm going to call this morning and what you've probably heard before, a poverty mentality. Okay? Now, I assure you, many of us in this room have a poverty mentality. And you don't even know it is. You think there's a difference. There is a prosperity mentality and there's a poverty mentality and there is no in-between. You're either going to operate out of one or the other, okay? Now, look at this verse. It's the first verse talking about God's desire to uh, prosper them. Uh, God says, Moses, I want you to deliver them out. And when they're delivered out, here is a promise I'm going to give you. Here's what's going to happen. He says, I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward those people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her, her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so will plunder the Egyptians. Now go back, plunder the Egyptians. Go back in this verse. It says, I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed again, uh, with you. That he was going to make their enemies favor you. You are favored. Now, you can turn to the person next to you and say, I guess you're favored today. We'll find out why. Now, Joseph, Joseph, when he brought the Israelites into Israel, into Israel, Joseph was the Pharaoh. The, the Israelites came to Egypt with great wealth. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were extremely wealthy. The 12 sons of Jacob were extremely wealthy in comparison to all the people around them. When they came to Egypt, they left the promised land because the promised land was in a famine. They brought great wealth to buy food from the Egyptians. But when they got there, Joseph was there. And Joseph said, I want you, he says, I want you to stay here in this land. Well, they stayed there, and they were favored in that land. They had favor. Everything they touched was blessed. Everything Joseph touched was blessed. They had the favor of God on their life. They prospered in Egypt to the point where they prospered so much, the Egyptians got angry and upset and said, these people are prospering more than we're prospering, and so we need to make them slaves. And they begin to oppress the Israelites, making them slaves because just Hitler did the same thing. Hitler did the same thing. If you've watched any history in Hitler, Hitler said the Jews are prospering when everyone else is not prospering. We hate Jews. We need to get rid of the Jews because through every season of history, God's people have always been prospered. Every, look through the word of God. There's always prosperity that goes with God's kids. Because God's kids are not limited to the effects of the world around them. And so the Egyptians started to rule over them. And even in slavery, even as slaves, the Israelites prospered. Whatever they touched, it prospered. Okay? To the point where, where, where they would make it more and more difficult for them and they would prosper more and no, Even though it got more and more difficult, the more they prospered. But what happened over 400 years is the family of Israel that went from a spirit of prosperity fell into a spirit of poverty 
because they saw their parents as slaves. That generation saw their parents as slaves. And then the next generation saw their parents as slaves. And then the next generation saw their parents as slaves. And they developed this mentality of poverty, which I'm going to talk about this morning. And we're going to talk about in this message. Okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to put a pause right there, and I'm going to switch in a new video. Is that okay? I'm going to make a switch here. And I'm going to talk about God's character of prosperity. God's character toward prosperity, and then we're going to come back to this, this story. So you ready? How many have their Bibles ready? You're going to need a Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, well, this is a great place to bring one. It really is. There, there is a lie of Satan. Satan wants to dictate to us the narrative about God's viewpoint on prosperity. And so there have been, what I said before, perverted preachers that have gotten up and made statements that if... If you're God's kid and you're prosper and you got that spirit of prosperity, then you're going to have the nicest Cadillac in the world. You're going to have the biggest house in the world. You're going to have all of this stuff you're going to have. And if you don't have it, then you must not be godly. What is your sin? What's your sin? What's your problem? Well, you don't have enough faith if you don't have the nicest Cadillac in the parking lot. You don't have enough faith. And they've taken this true gospel, doctrine of prosperity, and they perverted it to be something that it is not. You can have the nicest Chevette in the house and be prosperous. Praise God, right? How many know what a Chevette is, man? Everybody over 40 knows exactly what that is. You know, my dad had a Chevette and five kids. It was true. We all jammed in the back through it. You know, Satan twists the story quite a bit. You look at the story, there, and I've heard people say, well, you, you, there are, but there's another side. That is the prosperity side where they get in that ditch. Then there's the side where we say, well, rich people, they're just, they're evil. You know, they tell the story of the rich man uh, and Lazarus, and they said, yeah, he ended up in hell. Well, he didn't end up in hell because of his riches. He ended up in that place of torment because of his character. How he dealt with riches. You look at the rich young ruler who, by the way, w left. And Jesus says it's hard for rich to get saved because they worship their riches. It was a character thing. It wasn't the money that they had. It was a character thing. By the way, many theologians believe that it was a rich young ruler that came back around and ended up providing the tomb for Jesus to be buried in. That he actually left, but after thinking about it, came back to Christ and was saved. There, you know, when a number of years ago we started a Montessori school at our church in Michigan, and and uh, and we had, did no scholarships, no scholarships at all. It was just because we wanted to keep the school going, <laughs> you know. Because as soon as you do scholarship, everybody needs a scholarship. Even though I make one hundred fifty thousand a year, I need help, right? That's a poverty mentality, by the way. I'll get to it in a moment. Um, but the, we did no scholarships, and I remember someone called me. And they said, well, why aren't you doing scholarships? Isn't this what we're doing, trying to reach to the lost? And I said, yes, we are. And the rich people need a savior too. Now, in the first service, I said, how many believe the poor need to be saved? And there was a loud amen. And then I asked the same question, how many believe rich people need to come to Christ? And it was not even half said amen. Inside of us is this, this thing that we don't even recognize that people are going to hell. It doesn't matter whether they got money or not. That we have been called to reach people with the gospel of Christ. All of them. Amen? But there's this poverty. This is a very tweetable statement I told. Them. And not that I want you to do it. I just, it's like one of those things you think you'd, and, the, and I didn't even have it in my notes. The Lord just dropped it in my heart when I was sitting in the first service. Here it is. Wherever you are, you will try to pull people to that place. Wherever you are, you will try to pull people to that place. So if you're here, you will pull people up. But if you're down here, you'll pull people down. So you get critical and you tear down people that maybe are prospering. You'll try to pull them down. But if you're prospering, you try to pull people up. So what are you doing? Are you critical all the time trying to criticize? If somebody says, well, they really did well with that project. Yeah, I'd do well with that project. Too. Look all the help they got. They just... Right? 
How many know people like that? How many say, well, man, that, that was me actually just on the way to church today. If I'd known he was preaching on this, I wouldn't even come. Here's, look at what Romans said. I want, you, I want you to see something that Romans says because there's a lot of scriptures on this. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can come against us? Right? There isn't a demon in hell that can come against us. So you, he's, if he's for us, he's going to prosper us. Right? Look at this. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us. Now, his son was more valuable to him than any other thing God ever created except for you. Are you hearing this? He valued you the same as his son that he paid his son for you. The value he, of his son, he said, that's what I value you as. He, he took you from being not worthy of anything and made you worth his son. Somebody getting this? I mean, you, you may be saying, you're, yeah, but you need to get this deep in your heart where you begin to believe that. Wow. Wow. Okay? And look at this. He says, how will he not also along with him graciously, graciously, willingly, Without merit, grace means unmerited favor. He, he, without merit, favor, gave us all things. All things. You know what it means in Greek? All things means in Greek? All things. It means everything, right? It's very, it's very, you just need to know Greek to know that. I mean, it's just powerful when you just say it in the Greek. It's all things. I mean, Everything. You give me one thing, and that's what he meant. He gives it. Whatever it is. Why? Because you have favor. Because God wants to prosper your steps. It is the will of God to prosper you. Right? And you have to understand, in James chapter 1, it says, the only thing that tries to hinder that prospering in your life is when we don't believe that he wants to do it. Okay? So follow me on this. How many in here would love to prosper in this life? Just raise your hand. You love, and if you're not raising your hand, you, you won't prosper. Okay? You just, you're not, okay? You want to prosper, you've raised your hand, right? But guess what? That spirit is already in you. It's, why? Because the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the prosperity spirit that raised Christ from the dead that was on Christ is now in you. It's a matter of now releasing it and believing that and saying, okay, I believe that and I'm going to stand in that. That's why the Bible says we're going to read a bunch of scriptures and it's going to say meditate on the word of God. Meditate on the scripture because as you meditate on the word, the word enters you. It changes what you believe because in life there's a lot of things that the devil uses to get us to believe things that are not true and we say well I experienced that your your doctrine is based on experiences and not on the Word of God and the reason your experiences keep repeating themselves is because they're based on the doctrine of experiences instead of the Word of God you want to change your experiences start believing the word and the word will start to produce it in your life Does it make sense but you keep you keep amening your experiences you're gonna keep getting your experiences because it's really moved through faith. So the, here's the question I have. This is a great question I have. Why do we believe in future prosperity in heaven and not present prosperity on earth? Why do we believe when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a mansion on the streets of gold? Praise God. What good will that be? You're never going to be there. You're not going to need to buy anything because it's all going to be free. What good is streets of gold there? Why not? But why do we believe God wants to prosper us in heaven and not on earth? We have no problem believing God wants to do it there, but not, not here. He wants me to suffer. We blow each other. Right? Poor me. For the gospel, I'm just suffering. God wants to, pro does that mean persecution won't come? No, the Bible says persecution is going to come, but we'll prosper through it. Why? Though, the valley, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't fear evil because thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, thy prosperity, they comfort me, they walk me through. Okay, now you ready for some scriptures to kind of support all of this? I didn't have to even get far in the word. I'm going to spend a lot of time in Deuteronomy just giving you scriptures right here. And then, because I didn't have time to put them all there. We'd be here all day going through the scriptures where it talks about God wanting to prosper. Look at these verses right here. 
look in starting doing around. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and what? And prolong your days in the land that you will possess. Look at the next one. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. Somebody say amen. amen. The Lord will grant you what? Not just prosperity, abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock. And I, I pray, I bless your wombs right now, women of God. 100 of you right now. Just say, I receive that right now. <laughs> okay. The young of your livestock and the crops of your ground and in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. Next one. Carefully follow the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in everything you do. Next one. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and will, take your, and will take possession of it. He will make you prosperous and numerous in your an, uh, numerous than your ancestors. 39. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands and in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock and the crops of your land. Next one. Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Next one. His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his enemies. Look at the next one. They will spend their days in prosperity. How many say amen to that? I want to spend my days in prosperity. And their descendants will inherit the land. Next one. That I may enjoy prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join in the inheritance and giving praise. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Just look at your Bible, and I encourage you, go into the Bible, look up prosper, prosperity, or prosperous. Look up those things and just begin reading the scriptures. It goes on and on. Why? Because it is the will of God that you prosper in a land that is broken and dead and discouraged and defeated. There's something different about you you know we believe and we hear this said all the time i'm saved by grace right but that is actually not true at all you are not saved by grace you never have been and nor will you ever be saved by grace because grace means unmerited favor unmerited favor never saved your life you are saved by the blood of jesus christ it was his unmerited favor that gave you the blood of Jesus that washed away all of your sins. But to glorify grace is nothing more than to glorify favor, and that's exactly the ditch you don't want to be in. But here's the truth. Unmerited favor was given to you all the same. Unearned favor, favor that you did not work for was put on your life. So when we say, I have grace, what you're saying is, I have favor from a God, and I didn't work for it, I didn't pay for it, I didn't earn it. He just gave it to me. Why? Because I'm his son. Praise the Lord. I'm his daughter. Praise God. See, we live in a culture where you got to earn everything. There's nothing free. This was a free gift. You know why it was free? Because God created you, he loves you, and he wanted to give you favor. So wherever you go, whatever you touch, there's prosperity, a pure spirit of prosperity that's inside of you that's struggling to get out. And the only thing keeping it from coming out is a belief system that's saying, I don't believe it. I don't believe you exist. No matter how loud it screams. That's why you, it says consistently. You know why he says keep going back to the word, meditate on the word? Because he knew you'd never figure it out if you didn't. He said, go to my, you know, God is screaming so loud, I want to prosper you, that he is blue in the face. You, if you saw God right now, he'd have a blue face. He did, and he said, God, why is your face so blue? Because you won't listen to me. You continue to struggle in the brokenness of that world, and I have set you free. Do you know God did not ever talk, of, Jesus did not ever talk about the cross? Only when he was going through the cross. Only when he said, listen, I'm going to take you, I'm going to the cross, and the reason I'm going to the cross is because I need to. I need to. But after he rose from the dead, the 40 days he was on earth, after he rose from the dead, you know what Jesus talked about? He did not talk once about the cross. He talked about the kingdom of God. You know, every parable Jesus told while he was on earth was not about this world. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like. You know why? He said, I need to retrain the way you believe to think like the kingdom of heaven and not like this earth. 
He wasn't talking about the earth. He never talked about the cross. He was always talking about the kingdom of God because he wanted us to live in the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Are, are you hearing? At, on earth as it is in heaven. He wanted us to live here. We pray that prayer. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven because the kingdom of God, we're living. He said the kingdom of God is near. It's at hand. It's right here. He... It, We've often said that when I die, then it will be perfect by and by. So you're telling me death is your deliverer? Or is Jesus your deliverer? And he died already, so you're delivered. You're free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, I'm free. And I have, I have prosperity. I have favor. Look, look at this. Look at this. Prayer blessing. How many of us, we pray for blessing? I mean, I, I heard a guy preach against prosperity, in about, and I couldn't say a word because I was going to respect the guy who was preaching, as maybe some of you in this room are right now with me. But listen to me. They're, 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 I'm telling you, how many, when you pray for blessing for your kids, you want your kids to be blessed? You pray that, I, no, God, make them suffer. God, I just hope that they don't have enough money to buy their food. This is my daughter right here. I just don't want her to have enough. In life, God, I, w- I really want her to starve. Will you, will you cause her to starve, Lord? How many of you pray for blessing for your kids, right? And they're pr- when we pray, we pray, God to bl- pray for God to bless things, correct? Yeah. And we have no problem with it. What is a blessing but prospering something? We, when we pray, we want God to prosper our prayers. We want God to prosper the word in my life. We want God to prosper things in our lives. Now, that music is starting way too soon in this message. <laughs> Right? It's 1040, I'm convinced. Deuteronomy 30, 15 says this. See, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Choose. Choose, choose. Life and prosperity or death and destruction. And there are many people choosing death and destruction, thinking that if they walk in that thing of death and destruction and, and then I'm just destined for suffering and they're, do- they, they're caught in that, they think that somehow that's serving God more. God said, I've set life and prosperity in the path for you. Choose. What do you want to choose? When you wake up in the morning, do you wake up in the morning excited about your day or just dreading the day? You'll be dreading. If you have a spirit of poverty in your mind, you'll dread your day because well, nothing's going to go good today. i got to meet with him, and that's probably going to be terrible, and everything is going to be bad. I'll probably lose my job, and we'll have no money. I'll lose the house. My kids will hate me. My wife will divorce me. My dog will die of some cancer because I didn't have the money to pay for it to heal the dog. Right? And we get up, and well, I'm hating the day. And this year is going to be a terrible year. When I said this is going to be the greatest year, you know, whatever, this has already been a terrible year. Right? You're, you got a disease. It's called the spirit of poverty. You wake up in the morning, you say, all right, praise God. I am a favored child of the king of kings. I have a prosperity spirit living in me. Something good is going to happen. Something good is in store for this day. Because I'm going to prosper in what I do. Whatever I touch was the promise God gave. And you say, well, we're not Jews. We're not the children. Well, Jesus said you are engrafted into the vine of Israel. So you are. You have the blood of the King of Kings. He said, I shed my blood for you. It's the blood of Jesus. Did you know why there's life in you? It's blood brings life. And when you accepted Christ, he said, I released my blood into you. What he was saying was, I released my life through that blood. That blood is life. And it flows in me. I have life, and I have the ability to prosper. Whatever I touch, praise the Lord. Not just financially, because we always think it's just fine, but in my health and in my relationships, in my career, in my dreams, in my ministry, that we prosper. you got to understand why this is so important, because if you don't believe that you have a spirit of prosperity in you, when you're standing in an elevator with someone who's dead, going to hell, on their way to the pit... And God says, tell them about my love. If you have a spirit of poverty in you, your, your mindset will be, your mentality will be, I can't do it, I'll fail. I don't have the ability to do that. Oh, yeah, and God didn't know that. Just like Moses. Moses was sitting there and said, God, I can't deliver the Israelites. I don't have the ability. I can't talk. How am I going to deliver the Israel? God says, well, I'm going to be with you. He says, but God, I don't want to because I'm afraid I'll fail you. Know, I'll fail you. I'll, just like I failed you back in Egypt, I'll fail you again. And there's this failure mentality, this poverty mentality. And if you don't have a prosperous mentality, you will never 
go to that person and preach the gospel of love knowing, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prosper. Whatever I do, I'm going to prosper at. It doesn't matter how they respond, I'm going to prosper. I'm going to prosper. Exodus, look at this in Exodus. Look at this in Exodus. It says, if you do not let my people... Now, Moses went to Pharaoh, and we're in the middle of the plagues, and he goes to Pharaoh, and he says, listen, Pharaoh, if you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials and on your people and into your houses. And the house of the Egyptians will be full of flies, and, every, and even the ground will be covered with them. Go to the next one. But look at this. But on that day... I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you, this is where the Israelites live, okay? No swarm. the Israelites say, you need my fly swatter? We don't have any by us, right? So that you will know that I, that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. There is a distinctive favor I said this in first service. It's true. It's a joke here. You know, there's a flavor of God and a favor for us. God said, taste and see that I'm God. You know, taste and see that I'm good. Okay. <laughs> God has flavor. We have favor. God has flavor. We got favor. He said, there is a distinctive favor between my people and the rest of the world. Something different about you. We are marked. We are marked. There's something different about this, that the Spirit has marked us, that we have a prosperous spirit, not a spirit of poverty. We're not slaves to poverty. There is something different about us. Now, let me go back to the story of Israel. I'm trying to cut this message down so I get done in time. Moses goes to Pharaoh and he tells him, let my people go. And Moses says, if you, or the Pharaoh says, if you got that much time, we're going to make it harder for you. And these Israelites who had a spirit of poverty wanted to be delivered but didn't believe they could be. Who's this Moses? This isn't going to happen. And so Moses does it. And then Pharaoh, what does he do? He makes it harder. And the people start to question if that's true, what Moses said, that God wants to prosper us. And this is what he says. This is what a spirit of poverty does in us. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and put a sword in their hand to kill us. Immediately they're like, this isn't going to happen. And, Moses, and God goes to Moses and said, tell them this is my promise. Tell them, Moses, go tell them this is my promise. And, th and he tells them, and this is what they say. Moses reported to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because they're discouraged, of their discouragement and cruel bondage. You may be here today, and you have a spirit of uh, 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 poverty in your, in your heart. And you're not listening to what I'm saying. You don't want to believe it's true. You don't want to believe that God really wants to prosper you, that God wants you to do the great thing that he wants you. So many of us, and this is the truth, so many Christians sit there and just don't believe God wants to do that for me. He'll do it for other people, but not for me. And to tell you something, you need to break free from that thinking. God wants Christians to be the most prosperous people on the planet doesn't mean you won't have persecution doesn't mean that suffering won't even come because then he will try to do it but though you walk through that valley it will no weapon formed against you can prosper because you're prospering more than it's prospering does this make sense no weapon formed against you will what because you're prospering and only one can prosper Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Nothing can prosper more than what you can prosper if you believe it. Now, it's, it's, do you think in your mind or are you believing that in your heart? Now, here's, here's the... Look at 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It says, For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... This is such a powerful scripture... Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Do you know where else that's listed ex almost exactly like that? He says this. He says, Jesus became sin. He that had no sin became sin, so that you, through him, might not have sin. Right? How many believe Jesus washed away all of your sins? Then you have to believe this scripture right here. 
It's exact, it's like God wanted to, he's blue in his face saying, I don't know how else to pull. If you believe that he's forgiven you of all of your sins, then you have to believe that he also wants to prosper you in whatever it is he's given you to put your hand to. He says, I've became poverty so that you wouldn't have to live with a poverty mentality. Here, here's, here's, so the first, the first one. And this poverty mentality. Oh, I, I'm skipping. I'm losing track where I'm at. You just forgive me here this morning. Here's the effects of the poverty mentality. First, well, first is a lack of gratitude. If you have a poverty mentality, one of the things you'll have is a lack of gratitude. You won't be gracious. You won't be thankful for what you have. Okay? Listen to this. You can be as wealthy as wealthy and have a poverty mentality. You can have all the money in the world, you can have lots of relationships, you have lots of power, and still have a poverty mentality. Because the poverty mentality isn't measured by those things, it's measured by these attitudes. Poverty mentality is this attitude of not being gracious. Romans 1.21 says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. They didn't recognize God for what He did, that God blesses, that God is the one that's provided for all of my needs. They, didn't, they weren't gracious. They complained. They were complainers. They complained about everything. Hot soup's too hot. Soup's too cold. You know, I believe in tithing. You know what I found out is people who do not believe in tithing, you know a common characteristic of people who do not believe in tithing? is they don't give ever. They say, I believe we give, but we don't tithe. They never even give. They never even give. They don't tithe because they never give. Listen, here's number two, point number two, and this is why. There is never enough. A poverty mentality says, if I give that, I'll not have enough. As if you're the provider. He says, I'm Jehovah Jireh. A person who the church of Macedonia gave in their poverty. Why did they give in their poverty? Because it wasn't, they're saying, we're not the one that's providing. He's the provider. He says, I have a cattle on a thousand hills. I'll provide for all of your needs. What you're saying when you say, I don't have enough, you're saying, God, you're holding out on me. God is the one that prospers us. And so when we become giving people, when, we're, when we say it's just not enough, it's never enough, I just don't have enough, I can't give because I don't have enough, and you will always never have enough. Hosea says this in 1.5, now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. And and not warm. You earn wages only to put them in purses with holes in it. It's never enough. Why? Because you just get that mentality where I don't have enough to be able to give. I don't have enough to do that. I, I'm limited. I only have so much. I got, I got to guard the little that I have. And guess what? You won't have anything. You will live your life with that poverty mentality when God's saying, I want to prosper your steps. Somebody say amen to that. I mean, come on. Amen. Right? Here, here's number three. They're self-centered. They, only, they, they really don't want to help anyone else. They're, that little, little Grayson that was sitting there, and we raised money, and we said we need to do a, a nursery or a van like that. Well, I, I, really, I really have other things I would rather do for me than to help that little kid. I don't even know that kid. Why would I want to help him? I am not giving to some kid I never met before. Well, you just met him this morning. Right? We look at needs overseas, and they need to spread the... I'm not giving to missions. I've never met them. If they go to hell, it won't bother me either way. It will. That's a poverty mentality. It's limited. It's controlling. It's self-centered. It's pleasing. It's never enough. And you live in it. It's a tormenting life. And Satan wants you right there. Here, here's the prosper, prosperity. Look at 3, 3 John 2. It says this. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. There are people that are as poor as church mice, but they have the prosperity mentality. You look at the widow's mite. She gave two mites. You know why she gave two mites? Because my God isn't, my provider is not these mites. My provider is God. And I'm going to give my mites to make him meet every one of my needs. He doesn't change his name because of my situation. He said, I am Jehovah Jireh. I was Jehovah Jireh. And I will be Jehovah Jireh. And she put her two mites in that thing and said, okay, God, be Jehovah Jireh. God says, I will provide for all of your needs according to my riches and glory. Why? Because that's who he is. He has never changed. We do not need to live with a mentality that says God has a limited supply of whatever we need. Whether it's your health, whether it's your job or your relationships, God wants to prosper all things in your life. 
so that the world will look at you and say there's something different about you. I had a friend who owned a furniture store. I met with three guys that were about 10 years older than me, and we all had daughters. They've all graduated, and now mine are graduating. We're getting close to that. And Scott was here uh, this last fall. He came. And I spent hours with him in a hospital cafeteria in the base because the food was cheap and it was good. And, and it was bacon and sausage, so if we needed help, we were in the hospital, right? So, so we were meeting, and he owned a furniture store, and it was high-end furniture. It, it was Schroeder Furniture. And we went through the recession. 2008, when we went through that recession, uh, uh, we prayed for that business, that God would prosper that business because that's God's will, that we prosper. Do you know biz- furniture stores in that city were closing down, but his almost doubled in size. In fact, has doubled in size. He was building when everyone else was shutting down their stores. Why? Because in his mind, he says, God prospers us. And business began to increase. Now, he was just here, and he says, I get to golf all the time now because God has favored our business to a point where I have great employees, and God has prospered him. Well, that's him. That's not me. You know what the problem, what I really believe is God's trying to get a hold of Christians and to shake the poverty mentality out of you. It's just like the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear works like this. You open the door to the spirit of fear through Halloween, like Halloween's a great holiday where, where people go to get scared. If you open the door to a, a fearful experience in your life, you put yourself where you get fearful, what happens is there is a living spirit of fear. It talks about in Timothy, a spirit of fear that comes and lives in you. The problem is it doesn't just, so you get afraid of the dark. It doesn't just stay there. It reproduces. The next thing you know, you're afraid of a lot of things. And all of a sudden, you're running, you're having a problem with fear in your life. And there's fear all over your life. The same is true with the spirit of poverty. When, but it's also a blessing when it's the spirit of prosperity. Okay? There's a blessing side. When you allow spirit, that spirit that comes from heaven to come live, those heavenly spirits that come live inside of you. you by the way, when you got a spirit of prosperity, you worship the king of kings. You do not worship the stuff. You understand the stuff is there to fulfill the purpose of your life. And praise God, I get the blessing of the stuff to use with other people. There is no greater blessing to go up to somebody who has an electric bill they cannot pay and to say, I'm paying your electric bill, and they just don't know what to do. Like, they want to kiss you, but like, they're not my wife, and that's just not really acceptable. You should really, like, hold off on it. But they don't know what to do, because there's there's nothing like that to be able to do that. Right? Right? And there's this, there's this spirit that comes in, and, and so we're generous. The first thing, fruit, and I'm, I'm rushing through this. I understand. If it sounds like that, I'm, uh, it should be that. That's what I'm doing. Uh, the fruit of prosperity mentality is generosity. We're generous. We're generous. We're generous. We can't give enough. We find places to give. And as you start giving, and as you start giving, you give because you know there's no end to what God supplies. And God just keeps giving you more. Say, hey, uh, Gabriel, uh, go send some more down to him. He keeps giving away everything I'm putting in there. Keep filling up that storehouse. And and, and, and give to that. You're at the grocery store and you see somebody's in need and you just want to give. You don't sit there and think, well, let me calculate my taxes. And blah, 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 blah. The Holy Spirit puts in your heart, pay for their grocery. You just do it. You know, and people that, that they don't, that, like literally don't tithe. You know, they're saying, well, I can't tithe. I just, listen, listen. It's God's. It's God's. God says, I will provide for all of your needs. Do you believe that? I know it. But I don't know that I believe it, because if I believed it, I'd do it. It'd never be a question. I'd just do it. It's a lifestyle. i just do that. It's generosity. The only thing that keeps us from doing it is a poverty mentality. And it holds us captive, just like the Egyptians were holding the Israelites captive to poverty. In fact, in fact, in fact, when the Israelites went out past the Red Sea, the first thing God says is have them circumcised. And it wasn't just a physical circumcision. circumcision. They needed a mental circumcision so that when they got saved, there was a mental circumcision going on where that is poverty mentality. Now you're saved. Your father is God, and there's a prosperity he has for you. You were in Egypt when you had the poverty slavery mentality, but now you're out of Egypt and you're going to a promised land where I will prosper you. Here are the next ones. One, expectation of blessing and favor. I wake up in the morning expecting blessing and favor. Two, an attitude of blessing where I'm blessed when other people are blessed. I went and had my hair cut one morning or one afternoon and and Michigan, a lady, she said she'd gotten a new car. And I'm like, you did? That's awesome. That's great. Uh, can I see it? Show me your car. And show. She's showing me all this stuff. And, and the first thing she said when I said, that is great. That's amazing. First thing she says, you really mean that? I said, of course I do. I'm glad that you're blessed. She said, because I told three other people. There are three other people that are there. And they all asked me questions about whether I could afford it or not. 
I'm like, no, I'm glad. Because if God's blessing you, that means he's going to bless me. I want God to bless you because he didn't bless me. There are two blessings. Really, I'm glad that you're blessed because it says I'm going to get blessed. And if you can't afford it, I'm blessed that it's not me. Seriously, I'm blessed it's not me. I'm just blessed. But God puts a prosperous mentality in us where we just give. Where our, our, our mission in life, our vision for life is not attaining more and more stuff that sits in closets that we don't have room for anymore. But to use what God's given us to make a difference in the lives of people. And he just funnels it through and we get more and more fulfilled by the prosperity that God puts in our life. Here's the last one. This is very important. It has nothing to do with money, and it can have something to do with money, is the thoughts of great vision. You see, when God asks us to do something great, amazing, we can become overwhelmed with how big it is that we think, well, God won't do that for me. I mean, he, I can see him doing that for them, but not for me, because I, that is a poverty mentality that says you can't do that. When God puts greatness in your heart, that's God saying, thank you, God, that you've given me a spirit of prosperity because I know what you're calling me to will prosper because of your in me. He told Moses, Moses said, God, Moses, or Moses said to God, God, I can't do that. I can't even talk. And God says to him, but Moses, I'm with you. I will prosper whatever you do. And Moses says, God, I'm just too afraid. He says, well, let me give you Aaron and Aaron will be there. You know, Aaron was only a mouthpiece for a short time and God prospered Moses. Moses, God only gave Aaron to Moses to just get him started, and then Moses rose to the occasion. Can I tell you, you just need to step into what God's saying in faith and say, God, there is no way I have the money, the time, the resources, or all connections, any of this, but you're calling to me this, and you've given me a spirit of prosperity, and I'm ready to take a leap into greatness. Whatever it is, whatever it is. Will you stand?